welcome to the Speaker's Corner Virtual Masterclass. We're approaching a new year full of new inspiration and ideas. Perfect timing for our final showcase of 2020. I'm Helen Fospero. I'm a TV presenter and journalist. I've worked for all UK major broadcasters and I'm currently freelancing for programmes like The One Show on BBC One and presenting corporate events. Today though, I'm your host. We've secured an incredible speaker lineup for you this afternoon. Our aim to help inspire, encourage a fresh start, a clear mindset to reset and refocus and leave 2020 behind, concentrating on the exciting opportunities 2021 will hopefully bring for all of us. I'd love it if you have questions for our speakers, if you drop them into the chat function below during their presentations. I'll keep an eye on them on screen as they come in and ask as many as I can during our panel discussion. So please don't be shy. So on to our first speaker who needs very little by way of introduction from me. James Cracknell, OBE, is one of Britain's most successful athletes with two Olympic gold medals and six world championship titles to his name. Since retiring from professional rowing, James has become the founder and director of Threshold Sports and uses his expertise to captivate audiences. So I'm delighted to introduce you to British sporting hero, James Cracknell. Thanks, Helen. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, originally, I, I thought I'd speak about resilience, as I believe it's the determining trait in success. You know, perhaps I place resilience on, on a pedestal because I wasn't exactly blessed with uh, a huge amount of natural talent. And when I was racing, I, I'm convinced that there were any number of more naturally talented blokes than me in a bar saying I could have been. But I bet the biggest reason why they're in that bar, not on the field of play, was because the first time they got knocked down, they didn't want to get back up. Now, I'm not saying resilience is a synonym for tough. Okay, it's one of the alternatives if you're looking at Theosaurus, but so are irrepressible, robust, flexible, durable, buoyant, feisty, and spirited. All characteristics I'd want and expect and demand in a teammate, and then neatly encapsulated in that one word, resilience. Now, without it, nobody could execute the physically and mentally unrelenting, sort of motivational, sapping four-year training program and, and crew selection process required to win the Olympics. Every setback would be seen as a disaster. Every success over-celebrated. Pressure would, would limit, not inspire. And teammates actually wouldn't challenge or support each other in equal measure. And without any of those things, you've got no chance. You already can probably tell it's quite hard to steer myself away from talking about resilience. But instead, I've opted to talk about a period of my life where I was really struggling. I tried using the mental skills that had served me well in sport, but ultimately I had to face the fact they weren't working, open my mind and learn new skills and strategies. At this point, it had been more than six years since I raced my last Olympics, which was Athens in 2004, and my career and perspective on life were, were starting to change. Through a combination of, of luck, backing myself and making the most of some post-Olympic opportunities, I'd rode across the Atlantic, been to the South Pole, and I was somehow forging a career doing the things that I enjoyed. Um, but also now, despite not having been in a boat for Olympiad, I had actually started to, to retire properly, consciously. Up until then, I'd still been appraising myself as though I was ranked on a list. If I was at the top, I was good. If I wasn't on the top, something was bad. Now, I was becoming more reflective. Was I a good dad? Was I a good husband, colleague, mate? Was I happy? All the really important metrics rather than than where you're ranked. At this time, Discovery Channel had just documented my participation in a running race called the Marathon de Sable in the Sahara. Actually, I think it was more of an entry point into the landscape than any interest in my running ability. Um, but they were pleased with how the program went. And then they actually said, we want you to do a, what they called an active travelogue, which was traveling from Santa Monica Pier in the West of America through the States to ending at Statue of Liberty, so via cycling, running and rowing in a boat, obviously. Um, so we set off from LA and after two days, I entered Death Valley, so 300 miles cycling. I happily chucked the bike in the back of the RV at the appropriately named Furnace Creek. And it was time to go, to go running. And after sort of trudging 80 miles, surrounded by salt plains, sand, desert, and 45 degree heat, I resembled and felt pretty much like a, a piece of tempura. But the, the capacity of the human body, as you'll, you'll hear from everyone else, and its ability to endure constantly amazes and surprises me. 
And the last thing I felt like doing after running 80 miles was um, was getting back on the bike. And uh, there we are. That's the uh, so getting back on the uh, getting back on the bike. But it's amazing how the body responds quickly. The the fresh breeze, the relatively easy speed were helping me almost recover from the run. Um, the next day actually is is what Bev calls my wife calls my my second birthday, and it changed the lives of people around me forever and myself. I remember waking up and it was a brilliantly um, sunny morning, the stars and stripes banner outside the uh, banner flag, sorry, outside the motel was hanging limply. So it was sunny, warm, no wind. I thought brilliant, let me at it. Uh, my next memory was three weeks later in a very white room. So 15 miles down the road, um, I got out of the motel, turned right, so west, so east, um, and a, a fuel truck had hit me traveling at 60 miles an hour and it Wimmer had hit my helmet. I was airlifted to a hospital in Phoenix and I was in a coma for two weeks. And having me called to my bedside from the UK as soon as I was admitted in preparation for the worst, Ben, fa ben found out when I was like this that I was in, uh, she was pregnant with our, with our third child. I spent five weeks in that hospital and three weeks in a, in a London hospital before being discharged. When I was released, among other things, the neuropsychologist sat us down and, and, and said that 82% of people with a brain injury get divorced. So I hadn't left hospital, but already I was, I was a statistic. Will I be one part of the 82% or part of the 18%? The rehabilitation from the physical trauma was actually the easy part of the recovery. It was rebuilding people's confidence in my capability. My confidence in my capabilities was, was that much harder. And Bev recounts a story a week after I regained consciousness and the, I can't remember it but the nurse had given me lunch a starter a main course and a dessert and apparently that saying anything I tipped the starter and, and the dessert onto the main course um, and thought nothing of it and Bev asked the nurse what the hell's he done and the nurse's reply was they all do that meaning people with with a brain injury and, and for Bev that's when I went from being part of the normal population into a into a different group and I don't think I ever came back in her eyes. There are also behavioral changes. Uh, initially, I had a real lack of social inhibition and spoke before thinking. But crucially, I suffered a lack of motivation. I lost the ability to plan, organize, and had no self-confidence. Those were all traits that I'd previously been able to rely on. And those changes took time for those close to me to adjust to family, but also getting accepted back in the workplace took far longer. I was initially skeptical, perhaps that comes from a sporting background of behavioral therapy, but I realized and, and completely engaged in it. And being single minded, determined, which I think had initially helped in the early stage of my recovery, were now limiting my cognitive recovery. And it was made worse by seeing and hearing people's distrust in, in my decision making that previously had never been questioned. You know, little decisions on a daily basis were still were being questioned. I was improving, but my relationship with, with Bev and the, and the kids, now three of them, was, was definitely affected. And my lad was only six when I had the accident, um, old enough to be aware that his mum was upset, something bad was happening. He and his younger sister who come to America saw me in a bad way in hospital. And when I did wake up, I must have been unrecognisable to him. Uh, I spoke slowly, apparently I couldn't concentrate for very long. And when I came home, aspects of his behavior that had never previously bothered me suddenly did. I was inconsistent and distant when all kids want is consistency to be hugged and heard. And it really breaks my heart to think what he went through. Less than a year together, we were at home on a Saturday night, just me and him. I had a seizure and collapsed. And at that point, I hadn't been diagnosed as epileptic. I regained consciousness in the ambulance that he'd called. And he's grown up seeing his father be vulnerable, struggle, and nearly taken from him. And my old man's 75, and in my eyes, is still unbreakable. So for, for my son to witness that twice by the age of seven has a profound effect on him and me. Bev had commented that you know, I'd been quiet and down for significant periods, but crucially never cried in front of the kids. After the accident, I was determined not to feel sorry for myself, thinking, you know, how is that going to help me recover? And I realized too late that showing emotion and asking for help is actually a sign of strength, 
not of weakness. And without question, if I'd done that, it would have helped my lad, the family and my marriage, if I'd let them know what I was really feeling. And my son would have been able to say how scared he felt, lonely, sad and angry for a long time. And that again, that's something I'm ashamed of. We've had those conversations now, but for years afterwards, we didn't. I'm not having a girl neurologist, but they're not the most positive bunch. And they've repeatedly told me that my cognitive behaviour would improve, but then plateau after three to four years. By then, I'd recovered enough to know that if you allow someone to determine their potential, they'll reach far higher than if you say something, you're then limiting it. And at this point, for most of, of my marriage to Bev, I had a goal on the horizon, but at this point, I was really drifting. And so I think Bev's support had turned to frustration and criticism, which further, yes, it's understandable, but also undermined my self-confidence. So I become withdrawn and really carried a, a heavy cloud whenever I saw the kids. And they could pick up on the atmosphere between between Bev and I, and I didn't want that to feel normal in any way for them. I had to change. The Olympics was something I did not who I am. The accident happened to me, but I refused to be defined by it. And sadly, and it's one of the there were good things and bad things about being in the public eye a bit, but people ask, are you okay after the accident? I'd had enough of answering that question. And also Bev saw our life in two parts. There was the pre-accident and post-accident James. Everything I did was seen through the prism of brain injury. So I need to change her perception of me, other people's perception of me, and crucially, I think my perception of myself. And how was I gonna do that? Uh, I'm actually gonna start taking control of my shit rather than just mindlessly drifting. So I applied to do an, an MPhil on human evolution and behavioral science at Cambridge University. It will complement the work I've been doing on public health and show that my mental capacity could no longer be questioned. I would also trial for the boat race. So if I could win a seat in the boat race over 15 years after I last raced, it would show everyone also that physically and mentally that prism which I was now viewed through was totally irrelevant. Um, I was successful at gaining a place uh, at Cambridge. Um, it was a family decision. You've seen that picture before. And I took the kids up there. That's my college at Pete's house. I took my kids up there, made them an absolute part of it. But after a month, I realized I'd left it too late for our marriage before I went. I missed the kids enormously. Academically, I'd bitten off more than I could chew and rowing had moved on. I was playing catch up. I called home and, and told Bev, I'm going to drop out. And, and she said to me, people will think I've made you. So right then, I knew I had to sort it out on my own. And I did what I should have done months or even years before, call mates and tell them I was struggling. And as mates are, they were there for me. One recommended psychiatrist, I went and saw him and he gave me some simple advice. He prescribed me twice a week, I want you to go out and meet new people, ask them questions. When have you last done that? People will see you as you, they didn't know you before. And also you need to rebuild the free legs in your store, your relationship with your kids, the academics that you're going through and also the sporting side. You know, the kids, I had a, to rebuild that relationship with them. And part of that was I was in a different place um, in Cambridge and then I wanted to make it like home for them. I also academically had to get my head around studying when there was no internet beforehand. So throw myself into to both. And I think with the kids, especially, I'd been guilty, I think, as, as many of us are, of physically being in the room, but mentally being outside the room. And ever since Bev and I decided to separate, my, my belief is I'm going to be there physically and mentally for them every time I'm in a room. Sporting, I, wasn't the, I had the track record, but I wasn't that guy anymore. I was at the bottom and was now, to be honest, in a position that I liked of, of trying to prove people wrong. I had to change the way I trained, I had to change the way I socialised, I was older than all but two of the guys' dads who I was in a boat with, so my cultural references were slightly different. I made the crew with a month ago with the eight-month selection process, I wasn't the first name on the sheet by a long, long way, but I also made my presence known, I challenged them constantly to the challenges, to, to set the standard that we needed, and as with the Olympics, I wasn't going to not say anything and then regret having not said it after the race. In terms of the race itself, it was a brutal day, a day I'll never forget with a group of guys I'll have a relationship with forever. 
Um, I'm not sure that I'll make the uh, I'll make the 25th reunion as uh, I'll be significantly older than them. Um, it was an incredibly special day. Um, if I, I submitted my thesis nine years to the day after I got knocked off my bike by that truck, and I remember, I think when I handed it, I thought if I told the neurologist I'd be doing this nine years after, he'd have shaken his head. But it hurts that I'm divorced. I don't get to wake up with my kids in the house every day. But I now make sure the days that I spend with them are really filled and not wasted. They know I'm there for them unconditionally and we speak about absolutely everything. And crucially, they know that dad now doesn't come with a rain cloud. But it might not always be sunny, but the weather is definitely getting better for all of us. I think if the last decade has, has shown me anything, it's the, the real meaning of resilience. I genuinely believe if I went back into elite sport now, I'd be better equipped mentally to support myself and my teammates because of what, what I've been through. Thank you. James, it's so um, wonderful to hear that the weather's getting better for all of you. And uh, that actually wasn't the story that I was expecting you to tell. It was uh, extraordinary to hear you tell it. Um, really moving and um, you got me quite choked up actually, but I'm, I'm really pleased things are getting better for you. Do stay with us, James, because I'd like to ask you a few questions if we, time, if we have time at the end. And also to the audience as well, don't forget, I know you were probably gripped by what James was saying, so haven't had time to put any questions in on the screen, but do if you want to ask James a question at the end. Now, I've been filming a lot this year with the fast jet pilots who make up the RAF's iconic display team, the Red Arrows many of them former tornado pilots. So I've really been looking forward to meeting our next guest. Mandy Hickson is the second woman to fly the tornado GR4 on the front line. And Mandy's stories inspire us to communicate better, empower ourselves and draw the very best from the teams around us. She's known for her candour, humour, warmth and limitless energy. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Mandy. Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, guys, it's an absolute pleasure to join you all. And, um, you know, after that, I always go on after someone's been really emotional and I always get a bit choked up myself. I did it a couple of times on webinars so far and it always catches me out. So you know what, we're going to change the energy now and I'm going to invite you all to step into my office. So basically, 17 years flying in the Air Force, uh, much of the time flying this mighty beast, as Helen very rightly said, a Tornado GR4. Uh, only one of a handful of women that have ever flown it. In fact, only five have ever flown it on the front line. But one thing I really loved about that career was the fact that, you know, when you go to work, every single day is different. So one day you're taking off in a clean jet like this one, nothing hanging from it at all. You're involved in dog fighting, air to air combat, basically one pilot pitting their skills against the opponent, trying to technically shoot the other one down. Now, as I'm talking, you know, I am a mind reader and I can feel the energy across the virtual space. And you are all thinking two words at this point. Go on, you're all thinking Top Gun. Yes, well, do you know what? So was I, because when I pitched up to my squadron, Mandy just didn't seem like the right name to be having on my badge. So you've got the likes of Maverick and Viper and Iceman around. And I thought, what shall my call sign be? Should it be Ice Maiden? And I mean, that was something I was wanting to hand out, you know, but you don't get to choose your own call sign. And I am six foot tall. There was a program on in America at the time called Sesame Street. Oh, yes. Welcome to the wonderful world of Big Bird. Now, if you want disappointment, it's having to wear Big Bird written across your chest for 17 years. You know, it's not what you want to do. But what I truly loved doing was taking off in this jet, flying off through the valleys of the Lake District. You come round a corner, 
you look up onto the hills in front of you and you see somebody walking and you know they are enjoying the peace and quiet of the countryside and you think aha they cannot hear or see me yet but you can certainly see them your hands go to your throttles you get this overwhelming urge to suddenly ram them into full reheat thrust back into your seat accelerating to just under 600 miles an hour and at that critical stage of flying one wrong move it will go disastrously wrong so what do you do you turn the jet on its side and you give a really casual and jaunty wave at the top of the jet as i did on this occasion to be caught on camera no sooner had I landed, there's a tannoy, big bird, please come to the bosses. Oh, oh God, what have I done this time? He said, Mandy, have you been waving at the sponsors again? I'm sorry, taxpayers. By the way, thank you all for your donations. Um, I said, I have, sir. And he goes, oh, I love that photo. I want it blown up on the squadron wall. But you know what? I had a rocky road to get there. Um, firstly, I failed all the aptitude tests to be a pilot. Uh, secondly, when I first wanted to do it, women weren't allowed to be pilots. And then when I got to the very, very state final stages of fast jet training, I was at RF Valley in Anglesey. It's where Prince William is based, but sadly we never overlapped. Otherwise, I do believe the Royal Wedding could have been very different. Um, I was three trips away from graduating, from gaining my RAF wings, and I failed a flight. I thought, never mind, I failed many in the past, you know, like James was talking about, that resilience that we need as a sports person or as someone in the military, it had built up. And then I failed it again. And I was suddenly into this complete spiral of loss of confidence. I was given two more flights and then I was put up for a chop ride. It does what it says on the tin. I didn't pass the flight. I'm leaving the Air Force. And what I'd failed, I basically learned how to fly, manoeuvre at low level, navigation, close formation, like we see the red arrows flying in Helen. But we were putting all our skills together in something called battle or tactical low level. Two jets in the weeds, down as low as 100 feet sometimes. You're sticking with your wingman about three quarters of a mile apart because there is an enemy airborne, also comes as your instructor. Now they're trying to get behind you into your six o'clock position and you have one blind spot when you're flying. You cannot physically see into that space. So if you're a singleton, guaranteed to fail, but you give yourself a wingman and suddenly you've got that 360 vision. You've got that mutual support. It means you must coordinate your turns, have great situational awareness to project ahead. So as I'm flying and we're about to come up to a turn, we can't just turn to the left. We are now two singletons. So as we think ahead, we must pull up, cross at a perpendicular angle and we roll out in perfect formation, apart from me, because that's what I was failing. Every single night I went back to my room and I basically got out my cardboard cockpit basically sit on your bed, flicking switches, making radio calls and answering your own radio calls. There's a knock on my door and it's one of my course mates. Now I've been with this guy from the very start of flying training. He said, Mans, we have decided we are taking you out this evening. I was like, are you joking? I am going nowhere with you. I knew they'd all been celebrating the fact they'd finished basically, potentially in the bar area. So it was a dodgy call. So he said, please, will you trust me? And when he said this, I thought, Actually, what do I have to lose? Anyway, he took me down to the bike sheds and I'll be honest, the trust waned at that point, as you can imagine. But we got onto our bikes and we basically cycled off to the other side of the airfield where they're there waiting on all of their bikes with the remaining members of my course. And they had been very busy that day making their bikes into aeroplanes, basically. They'd stuck wings on and everything. And we now spent the next three hours basically cycling up and down this hangar with one of them yelling, 30 starboard, 60 port, rotate, doing all the maneuvers in the air that I just couldn't grasp on the floor. And suddenly the penny dropped and I thought, oh my gosh, this is so easy. Why could I not do this before? But I had been stuck in a rut. I had been so consumed with what I was doing. I did what so many of us do when we're in stressful situations, we isolate ourselves. And we're seeing that more and more now, aren't we? You know, as mental health is becoming more and more of an issue, people are shutting down. We're not communicating with people the way that we normally do. And I had done exactly that. Now, the fact those guys spotted that and took me down and they did it differently. I suddenly had this awareness, and that realization that this was so easy, but i have been fixated on this task in hand and I kept on doing it in the same way and I kept on getting the same results. And that's why we need to listen to our team, to our colleagues. Everyone has different ways of doing it. And it's by listening and sharing that we get to a better place. Now I flew the trip the next day 
I didn't know if I'd pass, but at the end, my instructor jumped out from the jet. And as he descended the steps, I just happened to glance back to see him kneeling down and kissing the floor. And I thought, oh God, that does not bode well. You know, he's so relieved I haven't killed him. He's thinking I'm alive. And he looked at me and said, what the hell was that, Mandy? And I thought, here it is, it's the moment critique. He says, you know, I really like you, Mandy, but you've gone from bad to worse. And he said, and yesterday, by the way, you were absolutely rubbish. Let's, let's just call it that. And he said, that was like flying with a different pilot. It's like you brought your mojo to work. He said, what on earth has happened? And I told him the story and he just went, wow. I said, it was really funny. He said, Mandy, it's more than just funny. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, something that you're probably not aware of because you've basically been in the course still, but the rest of your course are very much aware of this fact is that you're all in competition. There are only six spaces for your course to fly fast jets on the front line, the Harrier, the Tornado and the Jaguar. And you're number seven. One of your course mates has pretty much jeopardized his own career advancement to get you through. And when he said that, I have never felt so humbled in my life. And it makes you realize what's so important. You know, we, we touch on this all the time. It's about that trust, trusting in the people we work with. I, I saw this, I love it. Trust is made of many things. Credibility, you've got to be credible. But reliability, who are those go-to people? But also intimacy, and this is so important at the moment. Having that empathy, understanding what's going on in your team's lives. Because once we can be empathetic and have that emotional intelligence, then ultimately we can really help that team. But underpinning it always will be selflessness. And there's a reason that team is spelt as it is. It's because together everyone achieves more. And you go, yeah, that's corny, that's great, but it didn't work in your case, Mandy, because somebody now lost out. But when it was reported up through the chain of command, our squadron commander has the ability to keep one person on as a creamy, and it's when they take the very top person out of flying training and they stay as an instructor. It's like Top Gun in Wales, what can I say? And it meant that every single one of my course graduated onto our aircraft types of choice. Mine was to fly the Mighty Finn on two squadron on RAF Morham. And I have to say, I was so honoured to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. It's how I got into it. And to be able to serve my country and do the job I've done. But the, the lessons that I learned going through that training, um, and it really is relevant at the moment because I think so many people are struggling. And I think by having that compassion and being able to see it through somebody else's eyes is so important because I had not asked for help and yet my team saw I need it. So as you're in, these, in teams now working remotely, it's so important that we do go the extra mile that we spot when somebody needs our help. So guys, I'm gonna hand back to Helen now because I basically can't wait to hear what Spencer's got to say. So thank you ever so much. And I look forward to the questions at the end. Uh, Mandy, thanks very much. I think uh, it's fantastic that you spent 17 years with Big Bird on your top. That's still making me smile. Um, I was lucky enough to fly in a hawk actually, but I would love to step in into your office uh, one day. Um, you've really, really whetted our appetite. There's so much I'd like to ask you, but the questions have started to fly in now. So keep those questions coming and we'll save them for the Q&A at the end. Thanks very much, Mandy. Well, today's final speaker in our Speaker's Corner Virtual Masterclass, uh, last but certainly by no means least, is Spencer West. Spencer lost both of his legs at the age of five and candidly recounts how he never lost the hope or the courage that he needed to overcome the incredible obstacles that he's faced in his life. His thought-provoking message is, I believe, bound to help us find opportunity in every challenge. So uh, I'm delighted, Spencer, to hand right over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And James and Mandy, what a what an honor to to be considered in a in a group with the two of you. Thank you so much for everything that you shared. And it's so interesting is that we've all are sort of hitting on the same idea here. What I want to do with our time together is just share a little bit about my journey and talk about one of the most important lessons I've learned, which both James and Mandy I hit on, and that's this idea of asking for help. But before we get into that. Let's just sort of address the elephant in the virtual room here and get the awkwardness out of the way that obviously know your eyes aren't deceiving you. This is a new sweater. And I obviously don't have any legs. I was born with legs, but I was born with a genetic disease that caused the muscles in my legs not to work. So at the age of two, they removed at the knee in hopes that I could use artificial legs and get around that way. But unfortunately that didn't work out. So then at the age of five, they were removed just below my pelvis, which is basically what you see now. Now, after my surgeries, my family and I were told by the doctors that I would never sit up by myself, that I would never walk by myself, and that I probably wouldn't be a functioning member of society. 
but my family never refused to believe that. So we said to Putin only ourselves, but the rest of the world, that we could start by redefining what was possible for me. Now that's a little bit of my background of how I came to be. I grew up in the United States. I live in Toronto, Canada now. Please don't hold any of that against me. But what I really wanted to talk about today is this idea of asking for help. And I've learned this lesson a thousand different ways. And I will I'm sure I will learn a thousand more. But the first time that I really learned the importance of asking for help is when I graduated from university. Now, I went to Westminster College in Salt Lake City, Utah. I got my degree in communication and I moved from Salt Lake City to Phoenix, Arizona because I was tired of the winter and I needed some sunshine. Now, I was, I'm not a millennial. I'm on the cusp of a millennial, but I was chased sort of the North American dream, which is, you know, you go to, to university, you get a, a degree and you walk out into the world and this is how you make money. And people are gonna come running to hire you. When I walked out into the world, no one cared that I had a degree at all. So I found I had, I had a really difficult time finding a job. And eventually I landed a job answering phones at a salon and spa that I found in the newspaper. Uh, but at the time it was the largest salon and spa in the Southwest United States. And I thought, I'll just do this for a little bit until I can find something in my field. Well, it turns out I was pretty good at answering the phones and a lot of other things. And very quickly I climbed their corporate ladder. I became one of their operations directors. And myself and one other person managed a staff of about a hundred. Now this job, it gave me the North American dream money and stuff, a house, I had a dog, all of the things. But it, you know, it didn't light that fire inside of me. I wasn't excited to go to work every day. I enjoyed the people that I worked with, but I didn't really enjoy the job. And I thought, did I fail at life? And then if I failed at life, because this is the dream that I was sold, this is what I should want. And if I failed at life, then does that mean I'm not a functioning member of society? So for four years, I literally just existed day in and day out going to work. But after four years, I couldn't take it anymore. And I started to talk to my friends and family about what I was going through and I started to ask for help. And it was in December of 2007 that a good friend of mine called and invited me to go on a volunteer trip to Kenya. Now, initially I was like, have you lost your mind? Standing on my hands, I'm two foot seven inches tall. I'm pretty sure that's a snack to half the animals in Kenya. And I don't wanna be meals on wheels, thank you. And I hung up the phone. But I realized that if I was truly going to start a new journey, I had to step outside of my comfort zone and take a risk. So March of 2008, I went to Kenya. And it was a life-changing experience. But the moment that changed everything for me is when we arrived at one of the schools. And literally 200 kids came running out. They circled around me. And they were laughing and giggling and pointing and talking a mile a minute in language. I had no idea what they were saying. They were eager to give me a tour of their school. And after they gave me a tour, we sat in the grass and they asked me every question under the sun to get to know me. Where was I from? How did I get here? Where were my legs? Did I leave them in the United States? But at the end, after I'd, after I'd asked them everything, they've asked me everything, a young girl raised her hand. And she looked at me and in Swahili, the language I speak in East Africa, she said, Sukuja Hyokitu, Inga Fanika was in Rupia. And translated into English, she said, I didn't know that this sort of thing, meaning the loss of my legs, could also happen to white people too. And that one phrase changed my entire journey. Help me recognize how I could use my story to hopefully empower people to look at challenges differently, but also empower people to get involved with something that they were passionate about. Now, the piece that I don't tell very often about this story is that none of that would have happened had I not asked for help. Now, I went to East Africa thinking we were gonna help them by building a school and we did that, but I walked away feeling like they helped me way more than I helped them. So when I came back to North America, I just, I couldn't go back to my normal life. It just, it felt like an injustice. So I applied for a job at the non-for-profit that I had visited on the ground in Kenya that was based out of Canada to be a motivational speaker. Packed up my life and moved to Toronto where I was an ambassador for the last 12 years, but I've since moved on and continue to speak full time. Now, that's the first time where I learned the importance of asking for help. And if we think about that just for a second, uh, from like a corporate experience, we know that when we hire new folks, they're gonna need to ask for help, literally to navigate all of the things, whether that's, you know, when, when we're at the office, you sort of like, where is the lunchroom? And then when do we take a break and how do all the, the, the software work and all of those things. But there seems to be this unwritten rule that as we climb the corporate ladder, it's not okay to ask for help. And specifically right now, as we're all 
on an equal playing field experiencing a global pandemic. More than ever, it's important for us to take the time to find that courage to ask for help. Now, as, as a leader myself, I felt a bit embarrassed. I thought, well, I'm, I'm the operations director at the time of the salon. I'm supposed to have all the answers. And if we don't, that makes me weak. But in actuality, it's the complete opposite. I think it shows great courage. It rallies a group of people around a specific problem. And then you tackle that together. It's important for us every single day to do our best to ask for help when we need it. Now, again, because I've learned this so many times, I thought I should probably put this into practice. And a few years ago, I came up with this wild idea because I wanted to give back to East Africa that had helped me find my heart and passion for changing the world. And they were facing one of the largest droughts they'd seen in over 60 years. So I wanted to do something. So I came up with a campaign where I was gonna climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And I wanted to raise a half a million dollars for clean water in East Africa, again, who'd been facing one of the largest droughts they'd seen in over 60 years. I thought, if I'm going to climb a mountain without legs, I'm probably going to need to ask for help. So I asked my two best friends if they would come with me. They said, yes, we found a trainer. We found someone to um, lead our expedition up the mountain. We campaigned for an entire year. And in June of 2012, I set out to climb Kilimanjaro. Now, the hope was I was going to do half on my hands and half in my wheelchair. But I want to show you what the first day on Kilimanjaro actually looked like. This is actually easier. No, I know. Yeah. It's crazy, eh? Yeah. Your machine, Spence. <laughs> Your machine, buddy. 30 minutes down, 300 to go. His uh, training was for a wheelchair. We knew there was going to be parts where you'd have to walk in your hands. But it's looking like 80, 20 hands yeah. right now, which is a scary thought. It'll be OK. Just, uh, there's no rush. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. All right, man. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm like changes really quickly yeah you know yeah yeah do you think you're good for a bit and then the next step it's yeah just completely steep with yeah. rocks yeah. and we made it before it got dark Woo! yes just barely <laughs> last one so that was the first day of eight and a half days and i remember we got to our campsite that night and we had dinner and there was still a bit of daylight and our guide said guys i want you to look up over the trees Obviously, I'm so short. So one of my buddies picked me up and we were like, it looks like a mountain off in the distance. What are we looking at? And our guy was like, that's Kilimanjaro. And we were like, what? We thought we were on it. It's over there. And needless to say, we panicked because this is not what I trained for. But I'm really grateful that my friends said that they would come with me because I, I needed their help. They were amazing and saying encouraging words like just a few more steps. Keep going. It's really inspiring to watch you walk. When I felt like I couldn't go any further, they would literally carry me above their head. When there were parts where I could use my chair, they would help push me in my chair. In fact, one of the days, one of the porters who was normally carrying our stuff had wrapped me in a blanket and tied me to his back and was carrying me that way. My buddy Dave, who's in this photo here, came up behind me and he was like, listen, Spence, I'm only gonna say this to you once, but uh, you look really cute being carried by this guy. <laughs> now, I knew that not having any legs and trying to climb the largest mountain in Africa I was going to need help. But what I didn't anticipate is that on summit day, the roles would be reversed and my buddies would need my help because around 18,000 feet, they got hit with massive altitude sickness. And I was in that small percentage of people where it didn't affect me at all. We joke it's because of my height, but I don't know if that's actually real. I watched my two best friends get headache, dizziness, nausea so much. So they were literally throwing up on the side of the mountain. I literally watched my support system crumble to their knees before me. And in that moment, I thought a couple things. I thought, well, maybe this is it. Maybe we just give up and go back. Is it really worth this? And it was also the first time in my entire life, and I mean this genuinely, where I wish that I had legs that day. Because if I had legs now, I could be the one to carry my friends like they had carried me. But I don't have legs. So instead, I did what my parents taught me, and that was to focus on the things that I could do. My buddies kept saying, it's really inspiring to watch you walk. So I thought, if that's all that I can do, then I will do that to the best of my ability. And I stood in between my two best friends and I said, this journey started with the three of us and it's going to end with the three of us. And this 
is what happened next. Through the night, so it seems I'm not breathing. And now my dream. We started to head up the, the mountain to Uhuru Peak. Um, and that was a shock. It was snow, all snow. I think I'm breaking down. Remember, I told you guys back in Toronto, it's going to go to a point where it's physical. We do Andy, and it's gonna go mental push. Take those steps, those final steps. And you guys are experiencing it now. Both Alex and Dave are really, really, really struggling. Alex was like falling to his knees. Okay. And every step was excruciating. Okay, I was exhausted. My arms were killing me. My my hands were numb from, from standing on them. We walked so far. And I just tried to muster up everything that I had left. Someone coming, someone coming, save my life. This is for every kid that has been bullied. For every kid who had a disability and felt like they couldn't do things that didn't belong. This is for every person who felt they couldn't change the world. This is for every person who feel like they were lost in their journey. This is for every person who has ever tried to figure out what their life is about. I was told I would never walk or be a functioning member of society. And I'm at the top of the largest freestanding mountain in Africa. This is for you. So hand over hand and foot over foot, we walked until we made it to the summit and we collapsed and cried and we're a group of women that isn't afraid to cry. And we'd actually reached well over our goal, which provided clean water to 12,500 people for life in two communities in East Africa. But the most important piece of this entire story is that none of that would have happened. Had I not asked for help and had I not offered it. Again, we're all sort of experiencing something together and I know the holidays are upon us and it's, it's gonna look different. It just is. This is where we are right now. But this is the time that people talk about when we need to dig deep and find that courage. But the most important piece to actually act on all of that is when we have the courage to ask for help when we need it. I know many of us were looking forward to potentially holiday parties and you know what the new year brings. And this is probably going to carry over for a little bit longer. The best piece of advice that I was given and that I can give all of you as we continue to navigate is that we all have the courage and the ability to ask for help. And for those people around us that may be struggling to actually come to terms with that concept, which is very simple and we do all the time, it's also important for us to offer that help as well. So in the words of one of my favorite authors, Dr. Seuss from the book, Oh, the Places You'll Go, he said, today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Folks, thanks so much for letting me hang out with y'all today. I'll turn it back over. Spencer, thank you so much indeed. And a couple of uh, personal messages have come in to, for you actually from John, huge respect. Uh, John's done Kilimanjaro and says it's not easy. And Mandy, one of our audience members, Spencer, says that she did it last year. It was brutal. Spencer, you're a hero. And I'm ashamed to say, Spencer, I've turned down doing it in March. And that's making me reconsider because I thought it was going to be too difficult. And when I saw your film there, that's made me realize that, you know what, I should get some help and I should absolutely do it. Yours is an incredible and inspirational story from uh, which we can all learn. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, time now for some questions and they've been flying in. I'd like to start off by asking all of our speakers a question that's come in from one of the audience members. We seem to be living in a constant state of fear, driven by the negativity and division we see on social media, mainstream media and from our politicians. So the question is, as we look forward to the end of 2020 and an inspirational 2021, what are your top tips on creating or maintaining a sense of mental and physical well-being in the year and years ahead? So uh, Spencer, you're on my screen at the moment. So let's start with you, Spencer. I think for me, one of the biggest things that, that, that I try to do when, when I'm facing some sort of challenge and looking ahead is to take the time to take a step back and look at what, what should I have learned from this challenge? We're given these for a reason. It's not because we've done something wrong or the world is against us. We're given challenges for a purpose. 
And it's taking the time to look at what is that purpose that I was given this challenge for? And then how do I actually take that and teach that to someone else? So for me, I usually try to reflect at the end of the year on what that was and then ho hopefully set an intention for the next year. But that would be my piece of advice. Okay, James, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I think it's, yeah, in terms of the way I'd approach anything, it's, it's what do you want to achieve? And then I think you have to decipher the white noise that people are saying, whether it's just because someone says something very loudly from a position of authority doesn't necessarily mean they're right. I think you have to question, um, not assume they're wrong, but question, and then that makes your decision easier. And that, that way you can, you can plan without being told what you've got to do. But I guess what I've, I have learned, and I, I touched on a bit, is that having been in a situation where I was a day away from never seeing you know, my kids again, that actually there's things you can do in the short term on a daily basis that enable you to get through. I think that's been, I, found it, I haven't found lockdown especially hard because there's little things that you can do every day. And by the time you build those things up, it's actually, you realize you're pretty much living the way you want to. So I, I think don't get, don't let other people, it's right that there's fear and they, they explain the risk, but don't let other people plan how you're going to feel. You, you can be in control of the way you feel about things and what you can do. And Mandy? Yeah, I think it's just echoing that really. So I, I mean, one of the things, if you think about what we're living with at the moment, it's uncertainty. And that is, if you are to put people through SAS training, the one thing that they use, and we see it in all of these programs, don't we, is where they constantly change your goals and your targets. And that's what we're having at the moment, constantly changing uh, targets. And so you aim for something and then it's gone. And I think that's what people are struggling with at the moment, that uncertainty and where we're going. So to me, it's about breaking it down into controlling the controllables. You know, what can you do? I mean, we were running a session all about resilience yesterday. And one woman just said, I had to get a grip of my weight loss and I felt so good when I did it. And I thought, and that is exactly it. It's about the small things that you can manage. So we can't control what is happening in the bigger picture at the moment, but we can control how we allow ourselves to feel. So, you know, trying to feel gratitude for things, you know, taking time out to be build your resilience by going out for a walk, even if it's raining or, you know, just getting outside into the fresh air. These are things that we can control. And we would always put our oxygen mask on first, don't we say in an aircraft. So actually it's about looking after yourself to ensure that you're in a good state to be able to help the people around you as well. No, oh, I think some, some excellent words there. And uh, yes, it's certainly during lockdown. It's those, um, from my perspective as well, it's been those small things, those things we can do and the things that make you feel good in your day. Um, the question um, from Kurt for you, James, if we may. Kurt asks, how did you differentiate who you are versus um, what you did as a world-class athlete? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think it's, you know, the, the, I guess the, the reality is that, you know, it doesn't have to be in, in sporting perspective. If you're doing something, you're very focused on what you're doing as a, as a career. It's very easy to um, think that's the most important thing in the world. That's the most important thing that's, that's going on. Um, and then when you come out of it, you realize that actually very few people care about it and there's far more going on out there. It's just, it, it seems the most important thing in your life, but to everyone else it's not. And I think that gives it a sense of perspective and importance because the, there are times when you've got it as your overriding goal. And for honest, if I'm honest, the, the Olympics was, was a four year excuse to get out of going to things you didn't want to because you know, I've got to do this. I'm going to do this. You know, <laughs> The reality is that's as my, my father-in-law and, and his wedding speech goes, well, he makes the boat go fast, which I assume is a good thing. You know, it's the reality of, of the, the importance of it. And um, I think it was, it was the perspective, I think, is, is useful because you can get so lost in your world, you don't really appreciate the importance of it to everyone else. And, and the, my first World Championships was on the, so on the, the day of our heats, we woke up in the morning and, and Princess Diana had um, been killed in the car crash. 
and and then the funeral was on the Saturday, and our World Championships in France, and the funeral was on the Saturday, and they were they sort of we they were saying okay, you, you won't be able to race because all sports stopping, and part of you thinking well, you're you're locked into what you think is really important, and they let us race, and we had black black things on the 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 um flag went half mast, all that sort of stuff, and but we had no real understanding of how big it was at home and we got home sort of two days after and just saw all the flags our final was the day of her funeral and the whole country stopped and we were there mucking around a rowboat on a lake thinking it was the most important thing in the world and then you come home and you you see William and Harry uh, the ages they were walking behind their mum's coffin and you think okay that really is rowing in a boat doesn't mean anything at all and I think those those are the things that really put you in the reality you need to be in. James, just a, a small question from me that just seems to fit at this moment. You know, we all remember you on the Olympic podium and, you know, you're listening to the national anthem. Millions of people are watching you worldwide. There's this great sense of pride. You've achieved the absolute ultimate. Afterwards, is there a period where you feel a bit flat after all that kind of thing? I mean, I suppose my question was, what is it like on the podium? And then how do you feel afterwards? Well, like on the podium, but um, it's... I remember we we're getting onto the podium. It was uh, a guy over Steve Reg gave us his fifth gold medal. So um, I go, "What do we do now?" And then he goes, "Drop the flowers and don't cry," which I thought was good advice. And then we saw our we saw our coach afterwards, and he said that wasn't very good. And he got us to score it out of ten, and two of us scored it at six, two of us scored it at seven. So we kind of won on an average race, which is testament to our preparation. Then we you have a really you know, I've raised in the middle of the weekend to so get the second week to enjoy all the things you've missed for the last four years. And then I, re I remember being at the airport on the way home and, and our coach came up to us, up to me and said, how are you feeling? I go, yeah, I'm all right. And he goes, well, anyone can win once, real champions win again. And I was like, a week, you give me a week to enjoy it. And, and that's it, it was about repeated success. So, you know, you had three weeks off and then got back onto it if you wanted to do it. And, it's, I think that, but in, in life, that's taken me a long time to, to appreciate something rather than always look for the next thing. And it did, you know, I used to drive my ex mad, but there was no celebrating, there's no celebrating any achievement. It was always right, what are we doing now? And I'm still getting to do that properly, I think. Thank you, James. Well, I've got a question from Mandy from Sarah Johnson. Which plane, Mandy, past or current, would you still love to fly? Oh, probably the F-35, actually, just because it's just new and it's shiny. And I always have a bit of a gadget queen. So I think, you know, I'd love to do that. I mean, it, it's amazing to sort of get into technology where it's right at the cutting edge of what, what we're, we're pushing those limits for. So, you know, I feel very jealous of the guys that are flying that now. Um, but um, yeah, it would have been lovely as well to have a go in a Spitfire, but it's not too late for that. So. At some point, I'm sure I will get a Spitfire trip. No, I hope you will. I mean, we've seen a lot of the Spitfire, haven't we, with the uh, celebrations for the BBMF, the Brattle of Britain Memorial um, flight, which has been amazing. Another quick question for you, Mandy. How do you change your mentality from seeing risk and feeling fear to seeing risk as an opportunity? And um, perhaps, I don't know, perhaps we could apply that even to the front line. Yeah, I've I've always I've always been very happy with risk. Um, you know, obviously at a safe level. So I've never been you know um, ridiculous in what I do, but always very very planned and pragmatic as well. But I've always had a real propensity to take risks as well. So you know, and I see that the way I bring up my children. You know, if they're climbing up a tree, I go, Yeah, can you go higher? Great, do it. You know, I've not been the one that says, No, you might fall. You know, I'm sort of encouraging them, and um, which is backfiring on me as teenagers. I can tell you that. Don't do that, kids. Um, so it's it's interesting, but you know, actually, I think so often we're gripped by fear. And it actually ends up being such a limiting factor. Um, and I was flying, I flew in the volunteer reserves, actually. I flew with this young cadet. And I, will, I won't make this a long story, but she didn't show me that she was interested at all, but she was really talented. And at the end, we landed and I said, you're really good. And I said, you know, is this something you want to do? Why have you not been showing me that you're interested? And she was like, I was so scared I was going to 
be rubbish that I decided not to try because I didn't want to give it 100% and then fail. And I thought, how often do we do that? How often do we back away from things because we're fearful of what the outcome is? And that's why, you know, your story, Spencer, was so inspirational to me because having just done Kilimanjaro, I know how challenging it is and I know what, you know, the rest of my team went through. But you know, the fact that you would have felt fear at some point, I'm sure there, but you did it anyway, to coin the phrase, is just, I, you know, I doff my proverbial hat to you. So yes. our final question, because we are now not running out of time, but just coming to the end of our session, is for Spencer. Now, Spencer, you've spoken um, alongside um, some pretty impressive people. I'm thinking here of the Canadian Prime Minister, Prince Harry, Al Gore, Miss Piggy even. Um, who was the most uh, memorable person you met along those lines and why? Yeah, um, you know, for me, the, I think one of the most memorable people that, that I have had the opportunity to interact with, just being from the United States, was Martin Luther King III. Um, you know, with the 50th anniversary of his father's I Have a Dream speech, um, you know, I, I did a bunch of speeches alongside of him. And to be a part of, to be in the room with someone who comes from a lineage of such um, strength and, and perseverance was, was really incredible. And just a piece of history, you know, um, when we look at the civil rights movement. So I think that one, and then obviously, you know, Prince Harry was, was pretty amazing. And I got like two seconds with him backstage. And the only thing he said to me was like, I'm really nervous, <laughs> which I was like, oh, thank God, so am I. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Spencer. We have come to the end of this afternoon's event, but uh, don't worry because the Speakers Corner team are going to make a highlights reel so you can re-watch our presentations at your leisure, alone or with colleagues perhaps who haven't been able to join us today. And if you'd like any information about James, Mandy or Spencer, or indeed me as a host and presenter for your event, then please don't hesitate to contact one of the Speakers Corner team. I'd like to give my personal thanks. I've really enjoyed your speaking to James, Mandy and Spencer for their time today. But a very big thank you to you for joining us and for your company. I hope everyone has a lovely Christmas and best wishes for a prosperous 2021. And uh, thank you for having me.